Well, uh, we are in the conclusion of our series in the book of James, and today, actually, we are going to be looking at the last verses in the book of James. Now, if we were looking at the last verses of a letter written by Paul, we would expect to see some lofty, beautiful, theological benediction to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, etc., And yet, we see in James here, true to the nature of his entire letter, more practical advice. And this practical advice is related to the nature of genuine faith in our lives. So if you would turn in your Bibles to James, if you're not there already, James chapter 5. That page number there is for the Worship Center Bibles in the seat backs in front of you. Um... But James chapter 5, verse 13, he writes this. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Well, what we see here in these verses, as we've seen throughout James, I believe, is the evidence of genuine faith. James made that unforgettable statement that faith without works is dead. In other words, if faith is alive, it will be changing us. It will be moving us to to use our tongues, for example, in ways that bless people rather than curse. It will move us to care for the orphan and the widow in practical ways. It'll move us to pursue peace with each other rather than fights and quarrels. In other words, the way that you know faith is alive is the same way you know everything else is alive. It's moving. He says in verse 13, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Now, notice first of all that suffering and cheerful sort of covers the entire spectrum of human experience, doesn't it? I mean, we could use different words, but James is basically saying no matter how things are going, whether your life is horrible right now or it's awesome, move toward the Lord. Pray. Sing praise. You know, when things are bad, what do we so often tend to focus on? Our pain, our problems. And on the other hand, when things are great, we focus on our pleasures and our prosperity. But genuine faith always fixes our hearts on God. You know, it is worth noting, I think, from this, that before we can be honest with, um, before we can move toward the Lord from wherever we are, whether we're doing well or whether we're not, we have to first be honest with where we are. That actually might sound obvious, but I notice it doesn't say if anyone is suffering or has lost a job, let him dress up and smile. You know, when you look around on a Sunday morning, if you were to just survey the congregation, what would you say is the most common emotion people are experiencing at church? Happiness, joy, and cheer. And yet, do we suppose that everyone here is cheerful? Or isn't it true that many of you are going through difficult times? Many of you that I know of are physically sick and have been for a long time. Some of you have marriages that are in trouble. Some of you are addicted to some sin that nobody knows anything about. And yet we come here and we we smile. But God made his church to be a place where people can be real with one another. 
But I do want us to notice that while James gives us the permission to be honest with where we're at, genuine faith that moves will always move us out of that place. It won't let us stay there. If you're suffering, pray. Do something about it. If you're cheerful, give praise to God. Give thanks to God. I think this is also why James in verse 16 says, confess your sins to one another. That kind of gets right to the point. He's, he's taking that thing or those things that we would otherwise hide at all cost. Those things that would cause us to withdraw from other people and isolate ourselves. James is saying faith should move you toward each other with those things. Verse 19 is another example of that. He says, when someone wanders away from the truth, now, we in the American church are very respectful and polite, and we say, well, that was his decision, if we even notice they're gone. And yet, genuine faith moves toward people who are headed for destruction, even if it's not in vogue in our individualistic culture to follow people around. Rescuing people, that is what faith does. It moves toward God, and it moves toward each other. The other thing we see in this passage is that not only does faith move, but the motion of faith carries with it the power of God to change things. We don't just confess our sins to one another so we can just know and, and be informed or so that we can have something to talk about with other people, God forbid. The reason we confess our sins to one another is so that we can be healed, right? Right? So that we can find healing. That is what genuine faith brings. Verse 15, the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Now I want us to just take these words at face value. And notice the confidence with which James is speaking. There is no uh, tone in James' writing of uh, doubting the reliability of this promise, is there? He's not saying, you know what, we do it once a month, we come forward, we hope it happens, it may or may not. Just listen to what he's saying. The prayer of faith will save. The Lord will raise him up, he will be forgiven. Now there are theological circles that make it all about faith. You didn't get healed because you didn't have enough faith. And I want to just say right now that our faith is not in faith. You don't get healed by faith. You get healed by the Lord. It is He who heals. It is He who decides when and how He chooses to heal. I thought of it this way, that, that, that when you receive a meal on a plate, you don't eat the plate. You eat the meal. Faith is the delivery method by which the power of God comes into our lives, but it is God's power. But we can't get away from the fact that faith means something, because the prayer of faith will save and heal. In other uh, Ephesians chapter 2, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Even as we read these words and we look at this bold promise, I wonder if the skeptic in many of us is beginning to speak up. Hey, Remember that time you didn't get healed? You prayed? What about that? Hey, are you sure that this whole healing thing is still valid for today? I know because I have that same voice in my head. And I want to just ask this morning, if you would just respectfully ask that guy to be quiet. Long enough to hear what God is saying from his word. Because what we have here is a really clear promise. Now, I want to just say at the outset that faith is not a formula. That every time we want healing, we do this and this and this, and you pray seven times, and it happens. It's not about how hard I pray, or the words I use, or the kind of oil we use to anoint people with. Jesus healed in all kinds of ways. You see him speaking a word. You see him telling people to go wash. You he's using mud on people's eyes to restore sight. I think the reason is God never wanted us to put our faith in a formula. He wanted us to have our faith in Him because Christ is our healer. Now I want to just focus for a few minutes on Him. Who is He? Who is the God that promises healing? Because if we're going to believe this promise of healing, we have to know that the nature of the God who made the promise is consistent with the promise itself. That there's no heresy, right? Right? 
He is the God who, according to James, has always been compassionate and merciful. James chapter 5. He is the God who is the perfect Father. The one who gives every good and perfect gift. And the God with whom there is no variation or change. What this is saying, guys, is that this is the God who, whoever he is right now, he has always been and he will always be. And this is particularly true related to healing because God created people in the beginning spiritually, physically, emotionally whole and healthy. And that is where we're headed for. That is the hope of our salvation, one of them. But it says in Isaiah chapter 53 that when Jesus died on the cross, he died not just to save our souls, but to secure healing for us, for our bodies as well. Verse 14 says, if anybody is sick, so the implication there is obvious. Somebody has a physical problem. But then as the verse progresses, it says the prayer of faith will save the one who's sick and his sins will be forgiven. So the question is, are are we dealing here with physical sickness or with spiritual sickness? The answer is yes. If you look at the word that James is using, the word save implies the idea of total healing, wholeness, meaning that God cares as much about our sickness as he does our sin. Look at Jesus and the nature of Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, it says, Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, ministering to people's souls and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Now, lest we think that Jesus was just a blip on the radar of God's purpose, Hebrews chapter 1 tells us that Jesus is the exact representation of the nature of the eternal God. You look at Jesus, you know exactly what God is like and what he wills and what he wants for people. What we see here is a God who is not reluctant to heal and to save, but a God who is willing and eager to do so. David wrote in in Psalm chapter 103, before Jesus was on the scene, he said, bless the Lord, O my soul, And forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins, who heals all your diseases. Now, we're just going to challenge you here this morning. How many of you, with a show of hands, agree with the statement that God wants to forgive all your sins? Okay. How many of you agree with the statement that God wants to heal all your diseases? What I'm trying to say is not that you will be healed today of all your diseases. That's not my assurance to give because faith comes, healing comes by faith and faith is a gift of God. What I do want to do is say that I believe we have made a distinction where God places no distinction between God's intent to heal and God's intent to save. What I want to do is hold up the promises of God, the nature of God from his word and allow those to speak for themselves because faith comes by hearing and hearing what? Not Micah, the word of God. That is when faith is born in our hearts. Think of it from the standpoint of salvation. It is only when I am fully convinced that the death and the resurrection of Jesus applies not just to the world, but to me. Only when I am sure that that is true will I be saved, right? That's what faith is. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So when I know that Jesus' death does what he says it does for me, I am saved. And in the Bible, we don't see a distinction between the faith to heal and the faith to save. Both of them are in God. Both of them are based on his power. You know, I want to just step back a minute and and acknowledge that many of us have had hard experiences in this area of healing. Many of us have hoped and we have prayed and nothing happened. Maybe many of us have seen one too many of these TV personalities that have million dollar mansions and misrepresent, at least in my opinion, misrepresent the idea of Jesus healing. But I do also want to say God's purposes, his plans are above our own. 
We don't tell God what and when to do, and we don't understand why he does what he does much of the time. Think about Job from the Bible who went through horrible suffering. Why? Because he was a bad person? No, so that God would be glorified. Think about the Apostle Paul who prayed and prayed for that physical problem. We don't know what it was. Some people say it was eyesight. For that physical problem to be taken care of, and what did God say? No, no, because I want my grace and my power to be perfected in your weakness. So I acknowledge there are things we can't understand, but I also want to say that the point of James's writing isn't to go back into the past and analyze every prayer we've ever prayed and try to figure out why we got what we expected or we didn't get what we expected and what's the formula. That's not the point. The point is, Do you believe what God is saying today through his word? Because it's not an apologetic promise. Are we going to move forward? Are we going to act on what we know today from here forward? See, faith implies disappointment. Faith implies I'm not God and I don't know what God is doing, but I'm also not going to give up on believing that God can do anything he wants. You know, the essence of faith is a little child who takes his father at his word because he has no reason to doubt otherwise. My father said it, I trust him, so it must be true. And if we have this kind of faith, James says in verse 16, what should be our response if that really, if we're convinced that this is the truth and not just a lie? Verse 16, James says, therefore, therefore in light of this promise, Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. He's saying, man, if if this promise is really true, guys, and we have no reason to think it's not because God is the good, good Father, then let's get busy praying. Let's ask. But if we're still wondering, yeah, deep down whether or not it really is God's will, we just won't have the motivation to follow through with this. You know, a friend told me a story this week of a pastor from the area a while back who published a a newsletter, sent it out to his church. And in this newsletter, he said, pray for the troops in Iraq. And in parentheses, he put, as if that will do any good. It's a pastor. And guys, I look around at our church, and, and I am in the middle of this, by the way. And I see we have prayer time at the end of the service, and I see people having meaningful prayer times, but I honestly think the fact that we don't rush forward is because it's a reflection on how we view prayer and healing. I truly believe this pastor is not an isolated incident as if it will do any good. I don't think anybody, one of us would say that, but how many of us have felt that? You know, when we don't think it'll do any good, we won't ask. And if we do force ourselves to ask because we know it's the right thing to do, our prayers will be riddled with all sorts of caveats and disclaimers, giving God an out, so that in the likely event that nothing happens, we won't look stupid for asking. And so we pull in the help of all kinds of other people so God can heal. Now, I believe God uses doctors, by the way. I believe he uses medicine just the way he uses teachers and he uses mechanics, but that's not divine healing. God uses doctors. He doesn't need doctors. Jesus never said, go to the doctor. He healed people. You know, A.B. Simpson said this. He said, divine healing does not come to us through medicine, nor is it God's blessing on remedies and means. It is the direct power of the almighty hand of God himself He does not need man's help to heal. Well, in the nature of the book of James, I wanted to just offer a practical way forward. And I'm excited about this because we all have real life stories of God healing. And I think those stories are so important to share with each other, to encourage one another because it strengthens our faith. I believe that's part of the reason why James says, move into community. They could just as well have said, if anybody is sick, pray to God and he'll heal you. But he says, no, go to your church. Go to your elders. 
And I believe part of it is because when we're together, our faith is strengthened. We believe what God says is true rather than being isolated. Hebrews chapter 3, I'm going to close the service at the end today with that, but it basically says, um, take care lest there be in any of you an unbelieving heart that would lead you to fall away from the living God. But encourage one another every day so that you're not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. The greatest sin we could possibly commit is to stop believing what God says he can do. Well, anyway, that was a sidetrack. But I, what I want to do is look at James's practical example of the man Elijah. He tells the story of a man named Elijah. And the reason I want to do this is because James says the prayer of faith will save. And I'm sure there's this elephant in the room with some of these things where we're going, what is that? What is the prayer of faith that saves? Not only that, but who is the righteous person whose prayers are powerful and effective? What does it take to be that kind of person? I believe James mentions Elijah on purpose in light of those statements. And so I want us to look there. 1 Kings chapter 18 is actually where this story is recorded. And the story goes like this. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And this man, Elijah, prayed fervently that it would stop raining And for three years and six months, it stopped raining on the earth. First of all, wow. If we believe that, the rest of the stuff should be super easy to believe. I mean, I'm just being real. So this really happened. And then Elijah, this man with a nature like ours, started praying again, and it started raining again. And James says Elijah, and I guarantee that his his audience, who were Jews for the most part, right away they knew the story. Elijah, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good one. We're not as familiar, so I wanted us to look here. Um, 1 Kings 18, and I just want to really quickly set the stage. In chapter 16, a man named Ahab becomes king. He's the worst king Israel's ever had. It says he did more evil in the sight of the Lord than anybody before him. So as judgment, God puts it on the heart of Elijah to pray for a drought, basically. So 1 Kings 17, Elijah prays and it stops raining. 1 Kings 18 is at the end of this three-year, six-month drought. Verse 1. After many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. And I want to stop right there because this chapter goes in some different places. But the first observation I want to make on faith that is powerful and effective is that faith is based on the promise of God. You know, I think that many times there's these, there's these circles of theology, which are just bad theology, where it's the name it and claim it. Just imagine anything you want. Say, I by faith claim that mansion for myself. That's not faith. Faith is knowing what God wants to do and asking for those things. If you ask anything according to my will, what? I will do it. Why? Because I want it, and I'm God. You see, faith is based on the promise of God. And so Elijah, this is step number one in the power of his faith, is he cared enough to to get close to God to hear what God was going to do. We might think that this was an isolated incident when Elijah heard from God. Whoa, where did that come from? But if you read the context, these these chapters in 1 Kings, Elijah was a man who walked with God. It was the pattern of his life. He heard from God and then he obeyed God. Then God met him later and spoke to him. And then he obeyed God. And God kept speaking to him because he kept obeying. So you see, this is just one instance where he heard what God was doing. And this was the beginning of this powerful faith that, that started and stopped the rain. The story picks up. I want us to keep going in verse 41 of chapter 18. You can read the in-between. It's actually where the prophets of Baal can't get fire to come down from heaven. They kind of do a little detour. And then they come back in, in verse 41. Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of the rushing of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went on to the top of Mount Carmel, And he bowed himself down to the earth, and he put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, 
Go up now, look toward the sea. And his servant went up and looked and said, there's nothing. So Elijah said, go again, seven times. And at the seventh time he said, behold, a a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And Elijah said, go. Say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down lest the rain stop you. And in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. Let's stop there. Guys, I have to tell you, when I read that this week for the first time, my heart doubled in size. Something happened inside of me because God can do anything. He can do anything He wants if we will just know what He wants to do and we can pray The second observation is that faith is the assurance of things unseen. Now I ripped this off from the book of Hebrews chapter 11. You recognize that? It's a direct quote. Faith is the assurance of things unseen. Look at verse 41. Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of the rushing of rain. Now question. Is there any rain yet? There's no sound. Ahab's going, um, what are you talking about? But Elijah could hear it because he had faith. He was assured, this is what God wants to do. I'm going to pray to that end. And so go tell him. You know, this is why Elijah prayed fervently. We hear that and we think, I gotta really want it. You know? Or I gotta ask and ask and ask as many times as possible. And eventually this stubborn God is gonna do what I want him to fervency comes from wanting what God wants and praying for it until God does it. Look at verse 43 as another example. After Elijah prayed, he said to his servant, go and look toward the sea. His servant went up and looked and he said, nothing. Now at this point, I'm thinking in my mind, I would have quit. Oh, well, it must not have been God's will. But Elijah said, go again seven times. Unless we think seven times is a magic formula, it's it's no more the formula than the kind of oil we use to anoint people with. It is the evidence of living faith. Keep going. Keep moving. Draw near to the Lord. God wants this. I want it too. Verse 44, look at this. At the seventh time, finally, the servant said, wait a sec, A, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And Elijah said, go. Say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down lest the rain stop you. Now I love this. In this moment, I put myself in the servant's shoes. And he's going, okay, there's a little tiny cloud. And I'm supposed to go tell a fearsome king, the rain's going to stop you. I'm either going to look crazy, I'm going to get killed. What's going on now is that Elijah's faith is rubbing off on his servant. His servant is starting to wonder, What does he see that I don't? What does he know that I don't? See, faith is the assurance of things unseen, things yet to come, things yet unrealized. And finally, faith allows us to see and to be a part of what God is doing. You know, everybody else in this story was probably going about their business and then they said, oh, it's starting to rain again. That was a long drought. That was the extent of their experience. But Elijah was in the middle of it. He knew what was happening because he cared enough to find out what God was doing. And the point that I want us to get this morning is the point that James makes. And don't miss this. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Elijah was not a super saint. He was a man who struggled. He had a sinful nature just like the rest of us but that God has always worked marvelously through people with sinful natures, the people who are righteous. Elijah was a man who was righteous and his prayers were powerful. And I just want to say today, to be righteous is not to be perfect. It is to be right with God. It is to have a good relationship with God. You're on speaking terms. And the only way to be right with God is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who died on the cross, not just for the whole world, but for you, for your sin, for my sin. And when you are fully convinced of that, that's what faith is, you will be saved.
And at that point, you are right with God, and that begins this marvelous relationship. You see, God died, uh, Jesus died on the cross, not just to like, take care of these legal matters regarding our sin, but to reconcile us to God. And so when you come near to God, and you begin this relationship, and the more you walk with God, the more your faith will grow. Because faith comes from God. It's a gift from God. So the more you're with God, the more faith you're going to have, the more you're going to know what He's doing. And we will begin to pray over time. Not just prayers of hope, prayers of selfishness, but we'll begin to pray prayers of faith. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, your word. And it is, it is your word that gives faith. Lord, when we hear your word, faith grows in our hearts. And so I pray right now this morning, Father, that your word would cause faith to grow in our hearts. That we would hear your promise as the good father that you are that we would hope in you, that we would trust in you, we'd believe in you and believe what you're saying is actually true. God, I pray that we would realize that you are the God who can do anything, not only who can, but who wants to. So God, do what you want with us this morning. Speak to us individually by your Spirit. 